Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ben and this is the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. Hey family, it's Thursday and that means it's time to talk some Q. This is episode four of season two, Living the Dream. In this season, I'll be chatting with some of the most successful barbecue entrepreneurs out there about the different types of businesses you can get into and what it takes to be successful. Have you ever looked at charcoal briquettes and wondered how they're made? Or lump charcoal and been curious about how a chunk of wood becomes charcoal? Or do you have dreams of opening up an international importation business? In this episode, we'll be breaking down all three of these with an incredibly candid and insightful interview with Abel from Clean Heat Barbecue. So grab yourself a hot steak, a cold drink, and let's get into it. This is the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast with barbecue pitmaster Ben Arnott. How long has it been since your last confession? Support for this episode comes from Harvey's Kitchen. Harnessing over 25 years' experience in commercial kitchens and catering, Harvey's has a burning passion for food and they make amazing barbecue flavor easy to achieve for all levels of barbecue. Their entire product range is handcrafted locally in Brisbane from quality ingredients and they've gone out of their way to make their products easy to use with simple features like resealable bags. I've played around with their butcher's box and have found their preservative, gluten and dairy free rubs and sauces to be top notch stuff. The butcher's box has 9 rubs and 6 sauces in it. I love the ginger citrus salt on chicken wings and the hop and habanero hot sauce on everything. Right now, Harvey's is offering Smoking Hot Confessions listeners an exclusive 20% discount. Yes, 20%. All you need to do is head on over to harveyskitchen.com.au and use the code word CONFESSIONS to get your hands on some today. Once again, head over to harveyskitchen.com.au and use the code word CONFESSIONS at checkout for 20% off your order. Hi, Abel. Thank you for joining me in the confessional today. First things first, what was the last thing you barbecued? (laughs) <laughs> Good evening, uh, Ben. It was an absolute pleasure being on your show today. Thank you very much for having me. Mate, um, because we had the interview tonight, so I uh, had to do a rather very fast cook. So what I did is I um, I did some um, chicken drumsticks this evening in the Weber and um, sort of dashed out a bit of salad and a uh, few roast potatoes, which I also did in the Weber as well. Mate, that sounds fantastic. How did you go about cooking them? Did you use a kettle cone type thing or a drumstick rack? How did you do it? Okay, so what I what I what I normally do for sort of um, easy um, uh, week, uh, week during the week cooks because as you know we're all very busy and that. Um, so what I did is um, I just do them in direct heat. Um, I give them a nice one of my favourite rubs that I actually make myself, and um, put the, the put the lid on and just watch the magic happen and. In as far as the potatoes are concerned, I just um, I wrap them in silver foil and uh, add a bit of oregano, a bit of garlic, olive oil, salt, pepper, and a little bit of butter. Wrap them in foil and um, just let them do their thing. So, yep, um, that's exactly what I did tonight. Sounds divine, mate. I love the sound of those potatoes. Oh, awesome. They were absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> yeah. Now, mate, uh, as I said in the introduction, you are a charcoal manufacturer, so I'd imagine you'd have plenty of barbecues available to you for R&D purposes. I'd like to know, what is it that you cook on at home when you're cooking for yourself? Oh, mate, you know, I have, um, I have a, a, quite, an, a, quite an array of, of, of different rigs. Obviously, as, as you're well aware, you know, we have our own um, smoking, uh, smoker manufacturing company, South Africa, AR uh, Smokers. So my, my prize position is the Baron, and you've, you've seen that yourself. I posted it on, on your page. Um, but that, uh, that's my one offset that I use. I have um, a gateway drum smoker that I love using. I've got half a dozen different UDS drums that I've made. I've got an open barbecue spit. I've got uh, a dozen uh, different types of uh, Webers in different colors. I have a Go Anywhere, and I've also got a little pop-up grill from Sweden, funny enough. It's a little camping grill. So... I've got a lot of rigs, so I utilize most of them as much as I can. Ah, oh, right. Okay. I didn't realize that um, that uh, AR Smokers was part of Clean Heat Charcoal, or is it the other way around? No, no it is. Uh, what it is, myself, and, well, it's, it's, 
myself and, and Rob Curran, who's also my partner in the clean heat business globally, uh, um, Cur- um, uh, Rob Curran lives in San Francisco. He's based in San Francisco. So we decided to come up with uh, another company called AR Smokers and also uh, the Kings of Smoke. And the whole idea about that company was to actually incorporate a lot of different types of barbecues. And it's more of a lifestyle type business uh, and an outdoorsy kind of business uh, that we, we, we formed. And together with our, uh, another partner, Johan Fritz, who's actually the designer of these smokers, is based in Johannesburg in South Africa. We decided to come up with these, um, these products. Now, myself and, myself and uh, Robin are involved in the Clean Heat label, which is obviously a global label. But my other partner, who is Rob Sean, uh, I'm involved with them at Blaze Dry Products, and that is where our manufacturing facilities are for the charcoal in South Africa. So oh. it's, it's kind of a it's a kind of a, a two way split. So Clean Heat belongs to myself as a brand, together with Rob Curry in San Francisco. But my 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 factory actually is um, uh, I'm involved with Rob Sean and his family and. And that belongs to Blaze Dry Products. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Well, mate, that um, that that smoker is just a beast. I've seen the photos of it. It is dead set sexy. Oh, it's unbelievable. It really is beautiful, Ben. It's it's a handcrafted smoker, and every single piece of of, of metal that is actually um, constructed in there is all individually crafted. Even the rivets that go around the actual smoker itself, every single rivet is hand milled. Um, the handles are all handmade. The actual, uh, um, the hinges, uh, everything that functions on that smoker is actually handmade this, uh, by hand by bu- fantastic, fantastic and articulate artisans back in South Africa. Wow! So we we really, really are very, very chuffed to that product. It's very really a beautiful smoker. Yeah, right. Now, as you've uh, uh, identified, you are from South Africa uh, originally. And um, yes. I'd, I believe that uh, barbecue is referred to as braai over there. Is that right? That's exactly right. We call it a braai. And funny enough, uh, Ben, the first time I ever saw a, a, a gas barbecue, in, and I'm 55 years old, um, the first time I ever saw a gas barbecue was actually when I, I immigrated to Australia 22 years ago. <laughs> so, so, so it was actually quite a – quite a strange thing for me to see guys just grilling meat on a flat plate and using gas, you know, we've all sort of kind of kept that for restaurants and, um, everybody in South Africa actually dries. That's what we do. We, we grill meat on, on, on charcoal or, or, or wood. Right. Okay. So, so is that the, the big difference between braai and low and slow then is, is braai grilling as opposed to indirect low and slow? No, there's a huge, there's a, there's, there's a massive difference. Um, typically in South Africa, uh, we don't low and slow. It's only starting to actually take off now, and um, we've got a we've got a massive smoker that is actually placed in Johannesburg, and the the actual results and the, the interest has been unbelievable. Our partner Johan Fritz uh, from a Retro Industrial, who actually built the smoker, uh, decided to build a a uh, a proper a proper truck, a trailer that he that he has to actually physically drive. With, with a tractor to the side of the road because the smoker itself weighs three and a half tons. You can take 400 chickens. And the response from the South African public has just been unbelievable. Traditionally, South Africans, we like to direct, uh, direct grill uh, all, all our meat. And the way we sort of control heat is uh, our, our grills are almost uh, like a side of grills that you can actually lift up or down according to, to how you want your meat to, to taste. So... Um, low and slow has never been part of the South African culture, but grilling meat and grilling food over fire has always been there for millennia. Yeah, yeah. There's a lady from South Africa that I work with, and she's always talking about um, different South African sausages. She says that you just can't get the same sausages here as over there. Well, I can tell you one thing, uh, Ben. I, I'm a very, very, very privileged individual. Uh, one of my barbecue teammates that I compete with, uh, by the name of Hank Kruger, a South African guy, he manufactures, uh, the best burrowbos and burrowbos is, is just, for us, uh, we started, we started eating burrowbos since we, we grew cheese, you know, um, it's just been part of our culture and it's just a beautiful gourmet South African farmer sausage and he produces 
uh, burrowbos uh, and droibos, which is a, a dry sausage that you actually air dry in a dryer and built on down here. So I, I'm spoiled rotten. And I'm sure you, that your um, colleague that you work with would uh, attest to the taste of burrowbos. It's just such a beautiful, beautiful gourmet sausage. And it's part of our heritage. You know, we, we love to eat the stuff and we can have it for breakfast, lunch, dinner. Uh, we take it with us on, on road trips. We take it with us on safari. Um, there's no home in South Africa that you'll open the fridge and you won't find at least uh, half a kilogram or a kilogram of burrowbos lying there waiting to be eaten. Cool. So what makes it different to um, to like a like a regular Australian beef sausage? Uh, okay, so uh, so what happens generally with with sausages, and this is my understanding, I'm, I'm no butcher, but I'm from the, you know, the snags, that we call the snags down here. A lot of the stuff, there's a lot of fillers in them. There's, um, they really get sort of um, ground down to, to very mushy mints, whereas burrowbos is really very coarse ground. So it's, if you can just imagine, I mean, the best way I can explain it is like having a steak in a sausage. <laughs> that's the first thing. That, that's, that's in terms of the texture. The other beautiful thing about it is just the combination of spices and the beautiful, the beautiful thing about burrowbos and, 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 and its, and its heritage is that every South African family have their um, own unique um, uh, recipes. And there's a lot of competition that goes on amongst us. So when we go to somebody for a braai, we invite them over for dinner, and we're going to have a barbecue. Uh, we bring our own sausages, and everybody com- com- compares the different flavors and the different tastes, and it becomes quite a thing. Um, they have even uh, Budabos, uh braai competitions in South Africa where people actually pit against each other to see who has the best sausage, which is just it's just a really a beautiful, beautiful piece of meat that is just so well put together and it's just so tasty and it's so addictive to eat. It's just unbelievable. Oh, fascinating. Sounds like there's a bit more work involved than just the average Aussie banger. I, I don't know, absolutely. I mean, you know, some guys will actually sit and roast the coriander seeds that they use in there uh, and nobody wants to let, let go of these secrets. So <laughs> it's very hard, very, very hard to actually extract what they're doing. You know, everything's done hush-hush. But I can tell you something, when we're sitting around a fire and we've got the burrowbos going and we've got a couple of coldies happening and the jokes start coming out, it's just fantastic, mate. Really, absolutely beautiful. Mate, that sounds like something that the uh, South African and the uh, low and slow competitive scenes have in common. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so let's, uh, let, let's circle back to the start. So back to Clean Heat Charcoal. Mate, how did, um, how did Clean Heat Charcoal come about? Okay, so... so so our, our, our flagship company is Blaze Dry Products, and we are situated in Cape Ridge in KwaZulu-Natal on the east coast of South Africa, about 60 kilometers away from Durban. And I, I've been visiting the Australian shores since 19, uh, 1995. When I, arrived in, when I arrived in Australia, I would have to wait the whole day uh, before the factory uh, before the before management came to the factory, it started seven o'clock in the morning, and that, by that time it would be like five o'clock in the afternoon for us. So it was just driving me nuts. I had nothing to do, absolutely nothing to do in Australia. I was sitting there waiting for the factory to fire up in our markets in Europe and everywhere else. So my partner Rob said to me, "What if I what if, what if I send you a container and see what you can do in Australia with it?" And we sat down and I thought about what could we call our products that would appeal to the Australian public, but also tick all the boxes that are, as to what we were about. And we came up with the pro- we came up with the with the name, the label, Clean Heat. And the reason why we came up with that is first and foremost, it's it's the the fuel itself is really a very very clean bu- uh, uh, burning fuel, and it has a lot of it ticks a lot of the eco boxes that a lot of other brands don't. For example, it comes from a sustainable, new, renewable source. That's the first thing. Secondly, the way it is harvested is very, very eco-friendly. Uh, the other thing that it does is it, it helps, uh, uh, helps short-cost growth uh, by, re- by, by um, how, how should I say, it's an invader bush, if you like, for a better word. And by cutting it down, what it does is it actually encourages short-cost growth and it helps animals with their feed. It helps farmers with their cattle. And also, it, it creates a lot of job opportunities out in the bush where there aren't any job opportunities any other way. So it ticks a lot of these boxes. So 
by us coming into Australia and creating clean heat, um, we thought to ourselves that would appeal not only to, to the Australian public, but globally as people that are conscious about what's happening in the environment, we thought it would be a, a, a good label. And that's how the name Clean Heat came about. But our business has been going for 17 years now in South Africa. Oh, right. So well and truly before Clean Heat sort of started up as Clean Heat, you were already doing your thing as uh, as Blaze Bry. Yes, we started a small little briquette making plants up in KwaZulu Natal. And from there, we started um, expanding into the charcoal business. And uh, we may not be the biggest in South Africa, but we certainly have uh, one of the best fuels available. And our systems that we have, our quality control and so on, there's no other, there's no other factory in South Africa that actually exports the kind of quality of charcoal that we do. Yeah, right. Okay. It's um it it was very clever to go with that uh, with that environmental angle. I think people are getting a lot more um, aware of that sort of thing now. So can you um can, can you explain a bit more about what that renewable resource is that you use to make your products? Okay, so so what it is, what it is for us Ben is Namibia has a problem with alien alien bush alien species, and one of these uh, alien bushes that actually have taken over the place is a bush called the Mopani or the Mopani tree or the Mopani bush, if you want to call it that for a better word. And what it does is it actually inhibits all short, uh, short grass growth. So wherever the Mopani tree grows, it actually kills everything around it. Short grass grows, uh, graziers like the impala, the springbok, the kudu, uh, zebra, rhinos, all animals that are eating short grasses, it starves them off their feed. So by cutting this tree down or this bush, this alien bush down, we encourage short grass growth, and it brings back animals into that area. That's the first thing that it does. The other thing is there's a lot of farmers up there that are running cat, cattle on their stations, farms, whatever you want to call them. And by cutting those trees down, cutting those bushes down, it actually helps cattle with their feed. So it, it, it really has a great um, uh, uh, impact into our, uh, on our environment. And by us, by us eradicating this bush and converting it into charcoal, we're doing two things. First of all, we, we're helping animals uh, have sustenance. That's the first thing. And secondly, and more importantly, uh, or equally as important, if you like, for a better word, is that there are communities up in Namibia, up in the bush, that have absolutely nothing to do. And the government cannot possibly look after these people as well as they should be taken care of. So by, by creating a charcoal industry, uh, we actually creating employment for these communities that otherwise wouldn't have any money. Yeah, very nice. So, mate, what is the process like for taking a chunk of wood and turning it into a, a chunk of charcoal? Okay, it's 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 a very interesting one, Ben, and I, I like to keep things pretty natural. Uh, the way we uh, yeah, a lot of people do underground pits, and uh, other people use retort ovens. There's a lot of ways of actually manufacturing charcoal. But what works for us in the bush is we've got these mobile kilns. So if you can just imagine this massive drum, which is about two meters in diameter, and the wood the wood gets cut by it gets cut by hand. Um, we've got 450 people out in the bush cut, cutting cutting the bushes out. Now these bushes have a lot of thorn trees. Got, there's, there's a lot of thorns, a lot of small twigs, and so on. So they have to separate the big logs from all the twigs. So having said that, and when that's done, they collect so for two or three days. All they do is cut down and collect these um, these, um, these stumps, if you like. But then, we then what we do is we put kindling. In the, we level the ground down. We put a whole bunch of kindling down and we start a fire. We then take this mobile kiln. This you can just imagine this big drum, this big barrel, and we put it over the kindling and then we proceed to start throwing raw wood inside that drum. Okay, at the bottom of the drum there is a bit of a gap that so allows airflow to go through to accelerate um, uh, the fire. We keep adding and adding and adding and adding and adding until the fire starts getting to the top. When the fire gets to the top, you'll find that the bottom pieces are starting to burn now, so it starts dropping uh, considerably. Then we add more wood in there, and then eventually what we do is once we fill this drum up to capacity, we then block the top off completely. We put a lid over it, and we seal the bottom of the drum and we seal the top of the drum. So no, no air can actually, uh, no oxygen, oxygen can actually go into that drum. So the question is, how then does the fire continue? 
Now, wood has various variables, and it starts from moisture and all sorts of other things. But when it gets to about 475 degrees Celsius, uh, I'm told, is that you start getting a production or uh, evaporation of ethanol and tar. So both these things actually start fueling the actual fire inside that drum. Now, when all those variables have actually exhausted themselves, the fire itself goes out. But then carbonization starts taking process, uh, uh, starts taking, um, uh, starts taking place, if you like. It starts taking place. And no, otherwise, if you had to allow all the oxygen to go in there, if you had oxygen, it would just go into ashes. But when, when all those variables have actually burnt out of the wood, then all you have is this pure, pure carbon that actually carbonizes. And that process takes, you, you, you burn the wood for about six to eight hours before you actually snuff it. And then we come back the next day, we open the drums, and then we have this beautiful, fantastic organic charcoal waiting for us. It really is a beautiful, beautiful process. Yeah, right. Okay, so it almost sounds like it's uh, baked to the point of self-combustion. Is that right? Have I understood that right? That's, that's, exactly, that's exactly, you hit the nail on the head. It actually starts self-combusting. All the variables start evaporating out of the timber itself. Those variables start actually fueling the, tim- the, fueling the fire inside the drum. And when they're done, they're done. So all you're left with is carbon. Ah, there you go. So why is it then that, um, that, that that charcoal then burns for longer than wood? Okay, so because, <laughs> excuse me. One of, the, one of the main reasons is because wood is just a raw material. But if you change the constitution of the wood and you turn it into a carbon, you start getting a very, very compressed, um, high density uh, fuel, a, a fuel, uh, a, a carbon fuel that actually, when you burn it, when you actually start lighting it, instead of it flaming up and you notice with charcoal, it doesn't flame. Good charcoal will never flame. You get this glow coming in and it actually starts burning through the carbon itself before it. Uh, and the oxygen obviously reduce it into ashes. So charcoal will always burn a lot longer than wood. If you allow wood to be exposed in oxygen and in air, it just burns straight down to ash. It hasn't got the time. It, 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 the, the oxygen does not give it the appropriate time to actually carbonize. It actually burns right through it. But by snuffing out the oxygen and allowing the, the variables like the ethanol and the tar that are in the wood to actually do that process for you, you then get a very, very dense piece of carbon, which will actually burn much, much longer than natural wood. Ah, oh, okay. Cool. Thank you for sharing that. I've always been curious about that. Yeah, you're welcome. I mean, look, I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm you know, I'm far, you know, really, to be, to be quite candid and, and honest with you, I'm not really an, an expert. I can't give you the technical, technical specifications, but that's the best way I can explain it to you. Mate, that's, that, that's pretty good. That works for me. Awesome. So, how is um, how is charcoal different to briquettes then? Okay, so so the process of of briquettes is I can only talk about clean heat, uh, Ben, for the very simple reason that anybody has their own different processes, and I'd like to talk about one hundred percent charcoal, one hundred percent carbon, and nothing to hide briquette products, and that is exactly what our product is now. Uh, what we normally do is this, because the, pro- because we, the, the fact of, of the charcoal breaking down in different pieces, and it's carbon, it's very brittle. So when we pack it in our big 200 kilogram bags, and then from there we transport it from Namibia to our facility in, 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 in KwaZulu and in Gator Ridge, that's a, that's a trip of two and a half thousand kilometers from where we burn. So you can imagine by the time it gets down to our factory, there's a lot of the roads are rough, there's a lot of bumping you know, going on and so on. And by the time it gets down there, there's a lot of the car, a lot of the charcoal is actually broken down into pieces that are not really suitable for either direct grilling barbecue, uh, restaurant grade premium, low and slow, any of those uh, kind of mediums. So there's a lot of what we call the fines in the industry. Anybody calls them the fines. So what we do is we actually take that charcoal, those fines, we put it through a grinder, and then from the grinder, it goes down the conveyor belt into these big, you can imagine a big blender. In there, we add water and we add 10% organic low-fat cornstarch as a binder. 
and we make a porridge out of that. We then take that porridge and it goes through a molding system where it actually molds them into little pillows. From there, they fall into a conveyor belt, which takes them into an oven, and they are baked between 18 to 24 hours to extract all the moisture out of it. So what you've got to get again is, uh, is a 100% organic uh, charcoal with an organic binder. So there are no chemicals in there. There's no kerosene. There's no accelerant. There's no borax. There's no uh, a char from the ground, also known as uh, uh, anthracite. There's no lime in there. There's absolutely nothing. It's a 100% natural product. So that's how we that's how we produce our briquettes. Right. Okay. Now I I just want to just uh, get back to something that you just said before. Did you did you say borax before? Yes. So what happens is if you can just think, um and 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 I think the scientific uh, the scientific reason for it is that if you if you use anything other than a, 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 a low fat a low fat um, starch of of some sort, in our case we use cornstarch. The sugars that are inside the starches, other than the low fat, when you mix it with a with a char with a charcoal to make the briquette, and it goes through into the mold, it actually adheres itself onto the stainless steel plates, onto the molds, onto the steel plates, and it actually it doesn't bind. So a lot of competitors and a lot of companies, in order to save costs or whatever the case may be, not quite sure about that, they add borax into the mix. And by using borax, you actually get a binder. And we like our products to be 100% natural, so we don't use uh, we don't use borax at all in our products. But a, a lot of our other companies that actually manufacture briquettes do that. They use that without aiming to name any names, you know. No, 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 no. Please don't name any names. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. We, we, we had to, you know, we had to talk about our product and, and what we do with it. But that's why we don't use borax because. It's a chemical, you know, and we, we'd like to keep our products very really eco. We want to keep them as natural as possible. We want people to have the experience of cooking on, on a beautiful natural product that they know is healthy, it's not harmful, it's got no carcinogenics in there uh, or any other nasty. And, and that's what we're trying to achieve, and we're trying to achieve this globally. Mm, I'm going to have to keep an eye out for that next time because I um – I'm pretty sure I use something called borax as an ant poison around the house. So that's um, that's that's a bit of a worry. Yeah, and I use borax also in, um, I believe, also in uh, washing detergents and all sorts of other um, kind of stuff that they're keen with and so on. I, I, you know, I'm not very clued up about borax, but I do know. I mean, it's not it's not very difficult. I mean, you, you can actually name some. Of, you can you can Google some of our competitors and 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 you'll actually see for yourself. And these are facts that I've actually. I've looked into, I mean, we make a point of actually looking to see what other people are using that our competitors are using and what is it that we can do best to actually better our product. So, we get, you know, Boric is a commonly used uh, product in briquettes. Mm. So is, li- so is Lime. Um, there have been uh, uh, briquettes that have been analyzed that have had uh, uh, phosphorus in them, uh, all sorts of things, you know, sand, is another one that they use as a binder sand for for heat distribution. Uh, accelerants they use a lot of kerosene uh, and uh, and uh, paraffin is another one that they use. You know other um, derivatives from from the oil companies they use it for instant light products where they actually coat the stuff in. You like it? You can actually smell the stuff coming off it. I mean it's not it's not difficult to to work out. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If if, if anything, our briquettes been uh, when you light them. They've got a, it almost feels sometimes I'm at the movies because when we're using the cornstarch, you can almost smell the popcorn <laughs> in some of it, yeah, which is quite awesome. You know, it's got a beautiful, sweet, uh, corn, cornstarchy kind of smell, you know, and that is just initially, once they start taking, once they start taking and they take off really quickly, um, that smell also soon disappears and, and off you go, you know, you, you can put the stuff into, into your web or where you want to use it and just have this fantastic, um, meal that, I'm not worrying about what's in the briquette because you know it's just 100 percent natural products. Yeah, beautiful. So, mate, Clean Heat is doing its bit for the environment. You're you're doing your bit for the for the human environment as well. What's next for Clean Heat Charcoal? Okay, so you know we're always trying to improve and we're always trying to do better things. Uh, we we we've, we've realised that um, as a company that um, you know we we need to grow and and 
we need to to share the love with everybody else. So, you know, a lot of things have been happening for Clean Eat. As you know, I started Clean Eat in Australia two years ago, <laughs> and and um, within two years we actually national. We in every single state but the Northern Territory and, and Canberra. Uh, together now with my partner in San Francisco, we are busy with a launch in the United States next year. Myself. Myself, uh, Rob Curran in San Francisco and Rob Sean in South Africa. Uh, it's very difficult. Uh, I get very confused between the two because they're both Robs. So, <laughs> Mr. Sean and Rob Curran, uh, the three of us, so we, we're launching in America. We've also, to accommodate that, we've come up, we have uh, just put in a new plant in uh, at our facility, which is very interesting, another very interesting concept. Uh, an engineer discovered that he could actually convert a potato grader into a charcoal grader, which would actually increase production. So that's what we did. We spent a, a, a bit of money and we put this this new plant into our factory. And now we can actually do 12 tons. Uh, we can actually produce screen and bag 12 tons an hour, which gives us 96 tons a day. And in the summer season, when we're running 24-7, we can do just under 200 tons in a 24-hour shift. Um, we, we're hoping, yeah. So we're hoping, we're hoping, Ben. We're hoping to to grow our business, not just for the sake of growing it, but actually to share with the world this beautiful product that we are very privileged to be able to have uh, by virtue of the fact that we've got that resource in Namibia. If it wasn't for the invader bush that we have in Namibia, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing today. So I'm very thankful for that too. Yeah, it makes me uh, makes me hate the blackberry bush here in Australia even more. Makes me realise how, how how even more useless the blackberry bush is. Yeah, yeah. I know. look, I mean, you know, down in South Australia where I am, um, for a very long time, people were taking mallee root out of the ground, and it's been uh, uh, it's been forbidden to take it out because of the salinity issues that it's by taking the roots out of the ground. What it's done is it's actually created salinity uh, problems. Whereas we've been privileged by taking the mapani trees out of the, the invader bush out of the uh, out of the, the ground. We're actually doing the exact opposite. We're actually encouraging growth and we're encouraging the environment. So we're very blessed and very privileged to be able to 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 be part of this massive, massive work that that is going up in Namibia. And you know, and for ourselves, we only, we only, we only play a very, very small role um, compared to um, our, our larger competitors. But what we do, we like to do properly. And and I'm very thankful and very privileged, and I feel very honoured that I'm part of this whole movement. This is Bretto from the Flaming Mongrels, and you're listening to Smoking Hot Confessions. Big thanks go out to Jagged Woodfired for helping me bring you this episode. Buying a smoker can be confusing. Something for low and slow, something for roasting, a pizza oven. What about baking? The Jagged Woodfired smoker does all of these things. The question is how? First, the entire smoker is fully insulated. The firebox is insulated with kiln grade bricks and there are more on the cooking chamber floor, doubling as a pizza stone. The cooking chamber is then insulated with a 6cm or 2.5 inch insulation blanket. This means that the Jagged can get up to 600 degrees Fahrenheit in under 30 minutes, sit at low and slow temperatures using very little fuel and will even sit well under 200 Fahrenheit for cold smoking. Jagged wants to make sure you have a very happy new year, and so until the end of December 2017, they're offering an exclusive discount for you Smoking Hot Confessions podcast listeners. Use the code word CONFESSIONS at checkout if buying online, or quote it when dealing with them direct for 15% off your purchase price. Head on over to jaggedoutdoorovens.com, spelled J-A-G-R-D, to learn more. Okay, Abel, thanks for sticking around for segment two, mate. This is the part of the interview where we get into um, what it is you do and, 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 and how you do it to inspire listeners out there to, uh, to get out there and start living their dreams as well. So uh, the first question I want to kick it off with, um, I'd like to basically find out uh, how you got into the charcoal business. So what's your, your, your history? Okay, so my history really has always been with agriculture. So I, I studied to be, I studied um, clothing production management and leather, uh, leather technician. And um, so I was involved with, with the rules and I was always involved with um, abattoirs and, 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 and hides and skins for a very, very long time. But one of the things that I've always loved is I've always loved to cook and I've always loved to cook with fire. And what better way was there to actually do the things that I love 
and do something that's a consumable that I could also turn into a business. So um, our factory blaze by products was already existing and was owned by, uh, by Rob Shaw and his family. And I joined them a few years ago and started with the briquettes and that's how we got into the charcoal business. You know, and we started pushing it globally. Cool. Very nice. And so, so what's your life like now? Can you walk me through a, through a day in your life? Okay, so I, I, I'm, a, I'm a guy that likes to get up very early in the morning. So by about 5 o'clock, I, I get up and I do my thing. Um, sort of just all the usual stuff, wash my face, have a shower, brush my teeth, have some breakfast. <laughs> and during the course of the day, what happens is obviously you're getting different phone calls, people phoning you for products, people wanting to come down and have a chat to you at the warehouse, having a chat to me. Um, so oftentimes you get guys coming down, they want to pick up charcoal, they might be from barbecue team, guys from our page that we've got down here, SA Barbecue page, and almost always there's always a cold beer waiting for them. And if, they, if they're lucky, then we've got a few snags on the, on the barbecue or a couple of chicken wings, a few lamb chops. And that's the order of the day, Ben. So I run around from morning till night delivering, and then when I come home at night, I quickly fire up the Weber or I fire up one of my barbecues get ready for the evening. I like to cook on charcoal every single night or, you know, if, uh, I'll be hard pressed to miss a night or maybe two nights if, if I'm really under pressure. So while the barbecue is going, I'm preparing my meat, have, have, uh, have a good meal and then I'm straight in my office and I get stuck into phoning my, my partner in South Africa, phoning my partner in, in San Francisco, having a chat and seeing the developments and what's been happening, what needs to happen, what is it a process, where the containers are, where the ships are, and, 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 you know, and, and what needs to happen next. So my day starts at about 5 o'clock and typically ends at about 11 o'clock in the evening, sometimes midnight. Oh, my goodness. Wow. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's just 24-7 barbecue at your place. Yeah, it is. That's, that's exactly right. I love eat and breathe barbecue and charcoal, and I love doing it. I really absolutely love doing it. <laughs> so, mate, what, what skills would someone need if they were looking to, uh, to start up a charcoal business? Okay, so um, for a start, you need to be a people's person. You, you, you know, it's not a product that you can actually just sell like you're selling a, a table or a chair or an ironing board or a couch or, a, you know, a, a set of wine glasses. It's not that kind of product. You, you know, it's a kind of product that actually appeals to what we call in our business the three Fs, fire, food, and friendship. So... When you've got fire, you've got food, and when you've got food, you've got friends. So the kind of uh, marketplace that you're actually in is is, is a feel-good kind of uh, market. It's, you, you're appealing to people's taste buds. You're appealing to the emotions. You're appealing to a lot of beautiful things that actually make us human. So, I mean, what better way is there to, to enjoy yourself and to sit around a fire with your family and cook some beautiful meat and that everybody can enjoy, friends, family, uh, your buddies, or whatever the case might be, you know. Um, and and so, so for a start, you need to you need to be a people's person. You need to understand that this business is not a kind of business that you can actually switch on and switch off. It just doesn't work like that. I often get messages at nine o'clock at night. Hi, Abel, I'm doing a brisket tomorrow. I'm going to use your key needs. How much must I use? What shall I do? And you've got to be there for these people because. They believe in your product. They love they they love using your product, and there's a commitment that's involved. That is, it's not a nine to five thing. We're not selling insurance. We're selling a lifestyle. You know, we we push our lifestyle. We you know, it's 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 all about it's all about how one feels when one sits and eats a nice piece of meat using the charcoal. So you need to be a people's person. The other thing that you need to, to be is you can't be lazy. You really have to work hard at this. This is not a kind of business that, you know, it happens by itself. You've got to get out there. You've got to load bags of, of, of charcoal sometimes yourself. I, ha- I have restaurants calling me at 11 o'clock at night, 11.30 at night, saying, we, we forgot to place an order. We've got a whole lot of people, you know, that are here. The restaurant's full. We've run out of charcoal. And I get up. I get out of bed. I get dressed. I go to my warehouse and I load my ute and I'll go down to the city and I will drop off what they need. So you need to have that kind of commitment with the business. Um, that's if you want to do it properly. There's a lot of people that want to just, uh, it's you know, 
start at 9 o'clock and finish at 4 o'clock, and that's all well. But if you really want to do it well, you need to breathe, eat, and live charcoal and, 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 and whatever is around it. And namely, that's food, fire, and friendship. And that, that's the only way I can say to you, Ben. Mate, that's, that's actually one of the best ways I've ever heard that summed up. Food, fire, friendships. If, if you got that's, fire, that you is, get food. And if you got food, you get friends. I love it. And, that's, and, that is, and that is why our logo is Fuel Your Passion. So the three Fs actually amount to fueling your passion. So when you've got fire, you've got food, you've got friendship. And by doing all these three things, you can actually fuel your passion. Your passion for food, your passion for fire, your passion for your friends, your family, your passion for life, your community, your passion for doing the right thing by others. All these sort of things, you know, they're all sparked by a fire. Oftentimes you hear, you, 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 you see poets writing stories, uh, poems uh, and singers, and they all talk about this fiery passion they have in their heart. That's exactly how you've got to feel about your business, about charcoal. You really have to have that passion. And, and by doing all these things and, you know, and living these things and really living them, not just going through the motions, you feel that passion inside you and everything else falls into place then. That is beautifully it's said, like, mate. Beautifully said. It's like, it's thank you very much. It's like, that's exactly how I feel about my business. That's the way I feel about my community. That's the way I feel about my product, you know. Mm. And, 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 and uh, I dare say that's the way I feel about food too. I love eating. <laughs> <laughs> I love eating good food. I really do. Yeah, I, love yeah. eating. I love cooking and eating. I'm, I'm mad about that. You know, it's a really, it's just such a beautiful feeling. I don't know why. It's just, it really is, mm. you know. So what, what resources would they need to, uh, to get off the ground? Okay, so you obviously need a certain amount of money because you, you, you would uh, require equipment um, to, to, you know, you would, you would need uh, warehousing, you would need raw material, that, that costs money. Um, so money would be first and foremost. You would need a really a decent amount of space to be able to store your stuff. You would also need uh, a vehicle to actually deliver it. Or if you don't use your own vehicle, you need to outsource it, which in turn comes back, you need money. You would need that. And you would need to be very, very organized. You know, you know it's especially like if you're talking about doing your, your deliveries, you can't go from A to Z, Z to Y, Y to N, you know, N to P. You need, you need to be structured and say, okay, so, so every Wednesday I'm going to deliver in the north of my, my area. Every Thursday, I'm going to do deliveries in the South. And your customers get to know you that this is what you're doing. You know, every Wednesday, you're there. You phone them up beforehand. You, you, so it, it takes a lot of management, a lot of time. And those are the kind of resources that you actually, you can't put money on it. You know, you can either do things properly or you can just be a busy fool. And unfortunately, with charcoal, you can't. The margins are so small. The profit margins are so small uh, that you cannot afford to be a busy fool if you're going to make it a sustainable and a profitable business. You can do things properly or you can be a busy fool. Mate, I think that's the quote of the episode right there. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Love that's it. That's exactly right. Love yeah, it. That's exactly right. And, and, and that, that, uh, uh, that, that quote is not one of mine. That quote is actually my partner, Rob Shawns. Sometimes I get very excited about things and I want to do this and I want to do that. And he's just thinking, able, you know, we cannot be busy fools. Mate, those are some uh, some really interesting uh, tales you've just been telling. So, what are some of the um, unexpected surprises that you've encountered? Okay, um, in terms of my business, or just in general, are we talking about uh, clean heat charcoal? In in terms of clean heat charcoal, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, one of the things that really, really um, uh, 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 surprised me is how how good news travels very, very fast. You know, incredibly fast and. Um, when, when I first um, started in Australia, my, my whole idea was, okay, just start at Adelaide, and just see how we go so that I'm busy and so on. And one day I got an email from a guy in New Zealand who said to me that, uh, hi, I, I, got, I got your email from uh, one of your bags. My brother actually used your charcoal and he thought it was absolutely amazing and we were wondering if it's possible for us to be your distributors in New Zealand. So... For me, there was just such an unbelievable surprise. It was just so fantastic to know that somebody was so impressed that they would actually take the time to take our details from our bag that he found in the supermarket to send it to his brother in New Zealand 
so that perhaps we could do something so they could actually distribute and share the love in New Zealand. So that is really something that was really unexpected. I felt very, very humbled by that, you know, and I felt incredibly proud at, at that moment when, when I got that email. Yeah, that must have been a real buzz. You would have been uh, on, on cloud nine for a while there. Yeah, absolutely fantastic, Ben. There's, there's no better feeling than to get, you know, nobody likes negative stuff. And, you know, we get it. You know, we're business. We're not perfect. You know, we make mistakes. But, you know, when, when, when you're getting such beautiful surprises coming out of, of other, the, the word of mouth that people use your products and love your products so much that they're actually willing to tell somebody else and actually look at it as a business opportunity in another country, that is really, a, it's, a, it's a massive buzz. And absolute, it's, it really is. It's just fantastic. Yeah, very nice. So what's been your biggest challenge and how did you overcome it? Okay, so our biggest challenge for us is, um, it, I can only talk about our Australian operation, is first of all the distance that we have between our factory and Australia, uh, uh, the weather in South Africa, and I'll, I'll, I'll get onto that a little bit uh, uh, later, and, and uh, shipping schedules. Okay, those are the three. The other problem that we've encountered, but it's getting a little bit better now, is um, customs and excise, the Australian customs and excise have, have, have created massive, massive issues for us um, over the last couple of years. So the distance is the biggest problem and the reason why it's a big problem is that uh, it takes about between six and eight weeks before from the time of an order that is placed in the factory to the time it gets to or onshore in Australia. And that is a huge problem. So it's logistically, it's, it's, it's a hell of an issue. You, you've got to understand that the stuff travels two and a half thousand kilometers from, from the bush before it gets to our facility. And from there, it still has to be screened for quality control before it's packaged. After that, we need to, we need to, um, uh, uh book the stacks on the ships, on the vessel. And then it's up to them whether they do a transshipment via Port Louis in Mauritius, or it goes to Singapore, or it goes to Port Kelang. And at times, we often don't know how long it's going to be there before it gets into another uh, another uh, uh, vessel before it gets to our shores. Then when it gets here, whilst our Australian customs are doing a fantastic job and a great job, and they're also inundated with a lot of backlog and a lot of other containers that they need to inspect and what have you. So oftentimes we find if it is pulled in for customs inspection, it might take anything up to 10 days, 11 days, sometimes even 12 days before they actually release it which means a complete unpack of the container, a full inspection, then a repack, and then sent to us. Whilst that happens, though, it also is a risk of our products getting broken and, and spoiled because of all the handling. You know, it's um, a lot of people don't appreciate that carbon charcoal is very, very brittle. So if you if you handle the bags really roughly and throw them around, uh, they do tend to break, which actually reduces the quality of the product. So that's been another uh, another challenge for us. Uh, what we've done is we've um, we've changed our, our our order cycles to Australia so that as soon as a container leaves the shore of South Africa, we're already packing another one. We're not waiting for it to get two weeks into the sale. Whereas before we were saying, okay, let it let it go for another three weeks and then we'll start putting another one on the water. Now we're just doing like literally one every ten days. Is actually leaving the South African shores to actually uh, to, to to come to Australia. So that's how we've overcome it. The biggest problem that we have out of everything is nature. Then that is our issue, and our busiest season is in the summer. And both South Africa and Australia in the southern hemisphere. So you can imagine, at summer everybody's barbecuing, the orders are piling up, everything you know hunky dory, and then we have a tornado come through the factory, or we have floods up in Namibia. Or uh, there's storms down and they wash, they wash ships away down in the harbour in, in South Africa. The, 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 weather, the weather patterns have really, really thrown us out this year. In fact, we had a flooding in Namibia in February that we couldn't actually produce anything. for. We lost five months of work this year. So we've only really worked seven months this year. For five months, we couldn't actually work. We couldn't get dry charcoal into, 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 into our factory. So we had to dry it. And uh, recheck it and recheck it and recheck it to make sure that it was 100% bone dry before we could export it because only the best 
only the best will do for us and we don't compromise on our quality. So the weather we can't help, but everything else logistically and these things we've taken, uh, we've put uh, measures in place that we don't get caught with our pants down as we were doing when we first started uh, operating in Australia. Yeah, I guess when you're just sort of starting out, it's hard to sort of estimate that demand and make sure that your supply is able to meet that demand. But it sounds like you've built clean heat up, uh, up enough now that that demand will be pretty constant. So, you know, uh, as you said, as soon as one's on the water, you start packing the next one. It's very really constant. Now. And the other thing that has helped us as well is that whereas before I was doing everything myself, Ben, and everything was sort of uh, shipped out of South Australia, so the stuff was coming to Adelaide. And then um, we would have... Um, guys in, say, for example, Brisbane ordering three pallets and somebody in Sydney ordering two pallets. And before I knew it, like, boom, 48 pallets would be gone. And then I, I didn't have enough to for, for repeats, you know. And th- those businesses have grown within their own right so much, all our distributors across Australia, that they're actually now ordering their own 40-foot high cube containers that are actually going directly from their factories to the different states, individual states. So what that's done for us is that every single state now doesn't have to rely on Adelaide, but yet they rely on themselves. So we're sending the product directly from the factory into their warehouses in, in Sydney and in Brisbane and in um, in Melbourne and Western Australia. So and obviously Adelaide as well. So that really really helps. Uh, how we service Tasmania is by the pallet load. We send pallet loads over still. They're not in a phase where they can actually uh, order a full container. But until such time, until such time that their business grows. We will continue to service them from Adelaide. So that's really helped us. Yeah, that sounds uh, sounds like you got it all sorted. So um, so what's been your biggest success and to what do you attribute it? Uh, I, this is going to sound very funny. In all years of business, I think my biggest success has been Australia, Ben. It really has. And I'll tell you why. Uh, I was never involved in the low and slow community in the barbecue community before because there's never been um, anything of, of that nature in South Africa. But coming to Australia two years ago, meeting all these wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people that encompass the, the barbecue community and really making amazing friends along the way and, and, and seeing such good, honest uh, and open-hearted people that have allowed me into their spaces, you know, but through, through my charcoal. And to be able to actually create a business, we took a no-name brand, a no-name brand then. Keenit was a no-name brand in two years. And within two years, we are national. And this year, we were also runners up for uh, uh, brand of the year with the Australian Barbecue Alliance, which we know that um, I think it was, wasn't Barbecue Galore. I can't remember who took it this year. But it's just such an honor to know that people actually uh, love our product so much. And uh, we've created such a wonderful community and such a wonderful family in Australia. That to me is I took by far anything else that I've ever done in my life. And I, and I mean this sincerely, besides having a family and, um, you know, you know um, giving birth to a child and, and so forth and all the good things and, you know, loving my loved ones and my partner and what have you. But uh, in terms of business, uh, really, this has been my, my greatest achievement. It really has. You know, selling charcoal in South Africa is a no-brainer. Everybody uses it. Everybody uses it. You, you can go into a habit actually shop and you can buy charcoal. You can go to a chemist, a panel beater, a mechanic, you know, you have a bunch of <laughs> to use charcoal. It's like that. But, you know, to come to, to come to a country where predominantly everybody was using gas and it started changing this. And you know it yourself, you've been involved in the community and you see people starting to change into charcoal and people starting to use our product more and more and more and more to such an extent that within 24 months, we are, we're, we've gone national, and particularly in South Australia, where we supply 460 supermarkets and 140 servos in two years. That is a massive, massive achievement, and that is that is a, uh, uh, that is really a, a compliment to our product, but also to the people that actually support us. And I'm very thankful and very humbled by that. Yeah, for sure. So overall, as a profession, how how do you rate being a charcoal supplier? I wouldn't change it for anything in the world, Ben. Who gets to meet beautiful people every single day? Deal with an organic product, come home, like his own product, eat good food from it, and really enjoy himself to such an extent that he's having a conversation with you. How wonderful is that? You know, I loved hides and skins. It's also a natural product, and it had to do with a lot of stuff. But, you know, people wouldn't, you wouldn't have a leather business if people didn't eat meat. It's as simple as that. 
You would have people buying, you know, shoes, wouldn't buy belts. But here, this is like a very, very core material that actually feeds, feeds, nourishes people. You know, gets people together. It's, 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 it is just, it's something that is just, it is not seasonal. It's not something you do in summer or you do in winter. You know, it's something that you can do every day of your life. It started with our, with our, our ancestors. It, it goes from the beginning of, of man, you know, of the time we, we, you know, we, we, we were created or we came on this earth. And it's just wonderful. It's a, it's a, I, I just absolutely love it. Oftentimes I have to pinch myself to think I'm so, so blessed and I'm so lucky that I do what I do. You're listening to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast with barbecue pitmaster Ben Arnott. Our modern society is in a revolution at the moment. After years of exploring how we can use technology to better process our foods, we're now heading back the other way, realizing that traditional farming produces better tasting and healthier food. At the forefront of this movement is Pure Meats Robina. Not only are they a low and slow specialist butcher, they pride themselves on stocking ethically sourced organic products to help you give your family the delicious, proper balanced diet they need. Their meats come direct from Aussie farmers and are broken from carcass on site. Not only that, but all their products are made on site. From healthy, ready to cook stir fries for the time poor, to my favorite, the smoked crocodile cabana. And for you competitors out there, I can tell you that the quality of the competition meat is not only outstanding, but most importantly, it's consistently outstanding. So do yourself a favor and head to facebook.com slash puremeatsrobina to find out more. Alrighty, Abel, we're now up to segment three, which is our listener question segment. So we've got a bunch of uh, calls that are come in from listeners who specifically want to ask you personally a question. Are you ready to get stuck into them? Absolutely. All right, let's see what they have to say. G'day, Abel. It's Scotty from the Gold Coast here. Just wondering if you could tell me the best way to start a charcoal fire. Thanks, mate. See ya. Hi, Scotty. Thank you very much. Very valid question. Um, well, there, there are a couple of ways of, of, of doing it, or a few ways of doing it. I use uh, two methods. Normally, the, either the traditional method where I, I take, um, and that's how we do it in South Africa, we'll take a, a piece of newspaper and coat it in, in um, vegetable oil. Um, and I make little balls out of it and spread it across the charcoal and, and light the, the paper, then it, which in turn ignites the, um, the charcoal and slowly, slowly it sort of comes up to temp. But here in Australia, and, and I love this, I love my chimney starter. And I'm not one for using, um, uh, paraffin, uh, fire lighters, although I have used them, you know, from time to time. It's desperation cause, but what I normally do is I'll, I'll take a, um, I'll take a whole bundle of, of either toilet paper or the kitchen towel roll, also put some vegetable oil, light it, put it underneath the chimney, and uh, that's how I ignite my charcoal. Very cool. I, I do much the same. I was um, I was taught to cook on charcoal by my mother-in-law, who I remember her standing on the front deck of her wooden cabin on the side of the river with a low wooden ceiling on the balcony and uh, with her with her purple Weber and throwing a bunch of briquettes in there and standing there with a uh, with a cigarette in her mouth and a glass of red wine in one hand, and she get, gets a big bottle of lighter fluid and goes, squeeze, 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 and then sort of stops and looks at it and goes, squeeze, 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 and then gives it a third go, and then when the lighter fluid's dripping out the bottom of the of the Weber, she, stand, she stood back, grabbed a cigarette, and threw it in on, onto the charcoal, and up it went, woof. Or the mother-in-law. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you don't want to get on the wrong side. No, no, she was a wild one, that was for sure. G'day, Abel. Josh from Scan here. I'm curious to know what do you cook on personally, charcoal or briquettes? Thanks. I, uh, Josh, hi. Good evening, and thank you very much for you. I cook on both, really. I um, I tend to use my briquettes in my Weber because I find them, I find them sort of because they're evenly weighted. Um, I can control the heat a lot better. I don't get too much of a spike in temperature. I find that our, our charcoal can burn really, really hot. And sometimes I have uh, this, uh, this tendency to, to, uh, put far too much charcoal than I, than I need. Even tonight I did like, I don't know, half a dozen drumsticks and, uh, the wind was still blaring outside. Uh, and it'll probably go on for a couple more hours. So I, I, I prefer in the weather and when I'm being sort of, a, a, a slower top cooks, like in my UDS and, 
and uh, Weber Smoky Mountains and that kind of those kind of uh, mediums. I like to use my my briquettes, but when I'm doing sort of um, offset smoking or if I'm using if I'm doing spits, I will then use my premium grade charcoal for that. So I actually like them both. Hi Abel, Benton from Newcastle here. With regard to reusing charcoal, what's better, snuffing it out by a fire and closing all the vents, or dousing it with water, and why? Cheers. Okay, so and and thank you very much for that question. Okay, first of all, you've got to understand that charcoal is hydroscopic. So what it does is it actually absorbs moisture. And it's really not a good idea to actually wet it down for that reason. Uh, it, it'll take the ambient temperature. It'll take its environment um, that that is it's put under. So personally, and I think it's really it's the right way to go is to actually just snuff out the oxygen uh, when there's no oxygen, the fire will die out, and then you can actually have a perfectly dry piece of charcoal the next day that you can actually use. If you wet it, that doesn't mean that you can't relight it. All it means is now you've got to take it out, spread it out, make sure that all the humidity and the moisture has evaporated before you actually um, light it again. The other problem with that is you can never be too sure how much moisture there is inside that charcoal. So it may be dry on the outside, but it must still retain some moisture, and then you're going to start getting that steamy black smoke coming out of it, which will actually affect your cook. So uh, between the two the two different uh, processes, I would highly recommend that you actually snuff, it, snuff the oxygen out. Hi, Abel. Uh, this is Matt from Brisbane. Um, I'd like to know what your take is on the differences in the barbecue culture here in Australia versus the barbecue culture in South Africa. Thank you. Hi, Matt. Thank you very much for your, um, for your question. You know, there are a lot of similarities and there are a lot of differences. Yeah, in South Africa, people don't tend to to uh, use gas in their in their barbecues. Um, uh, funny enough, as I was saying earlier on, it's the first time I actually saw a gas that was uh, in Australia. Um, the difference being, I think that Australians are more sort of prone to following a lot of the American low and slow trends, where South Africa is still catching up with that. So South Africans are a little bit behind on that one. But when it comes to op- open grill, direct grilling, and that, it's pretty much the same stuff. You know, everybody's doing their lamb chops, they're doing their, their steaks, they do their chicken wings, their drumsticks, their snags, their sausages, and what have you. So there's a lot of similarities, and I think the, the differences are very subtle. And I think in, in, in due course, um, as, as South Africa sort of catches on to the low and slow scene, and it's really starting, I'm getting a lot of, uh, a lot of inquiries about my smokers, we're getting a lot of inquiries about fruit wood and so on. I think South Africa would pretty much on the same on the same train as as we are here in Australia. Um, the other thing also is that the way that South Africans prepare their meat uh, for barbecuing is a little bit more exotic than uh, we have here. Yeah, they they're very into a lot of spices, and South Africans like to heat a lot. So you'll find that a lot of their their marinades and a lot of their rubs are very 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 spicy indeed. And I think that is a tribute to the. Uh, the Cape Malays that came from Malaysia back in the 1800s, uh, the Indians that also arrived at colonial England, and we've got a lot of spices in our in our rubs, uh, um, as opposed to they prefer the spiciest stuff rather than the sweeter stuff that we, we often get done here in Australia. But in terms of uh, the differences, um, I think uh, a lot of there's a lot of similarities between the two countries, but I still think South Africa needs to catch up on the low and slow. Um, they're not as advanced as we are down here. I know that there's a bit of a, a bit of a movement in Australia at the moment towards um, native to, towards using native Australian uh, herbs and spices. Um, what are yep. some some native South African herbs and spices that get used in barbecue over there? Um, we <laughs> there's I, I can tell you there's a lot of South Africans which are very uniquely South African. Uh, I don't know exactly what the ingredients are. Like we've got a we've got a spice called aromat, and there's not a single household in South Africa that hasn't got a dry rub called aromat. And we use it uh, on chicken, on pork, on fish, everywhere. It's just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful uh, rub. Another one is that we've got a rub for potatoes. which is, It really does my head in. It's actually a rub for potatoes. And it is just absolutely beautiful. I cannot explain to you the, the, um, the flavors in there, but some of the flavors that are very highly used in South Africa 
is um, uh, uh, the piri piri, which obviously is a bird's eye chili, is a massive one. We like to use dry coriander in our, in our rubs, mm-hmm. a lot of coriander. Um, they love to use, obviously, garlic like everybody else. And um, there are a lot of influences from India. So we use a lot of the Indian spices in our rubs, like masala and uh, and curries and, and, and uh, the uh, kind of Asian sort of flavors in our food. But in particular, we like to use a lot of chili. Wow, that sounds fascinating. Really beautiful. Really, really awesome stuff. Yeah, the, the, it's a very different sounding flavor profile to what we're used to over here. I'm going to have to go and uh, do a bit of research and check that out. Oh, it is. It is. I mean, um, we've got, uh, you know, I'd love to send you some stuff. We've got a shop down here called uh, uh, South African Food and Booze. And the gentleman, Mark Nolan, he, he imports uh, all these uh, South African food products. And the amount of rubs that I find there, like you'll find peri peri powder and you'll find peri peri sauces. And you also find like your sweet hot, hot sauces. But when I say to you sweet hot, you know, like you get like a sweet chili and you, you know, like you get a sweet chili type of. Um, the Thai style sauce. Um, yeah, yeah. 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 You'll, you'll, you'll feel that sweetness. But with, in a, in a sweet chili sauce, you don't really feel the chili. Whereas in our, in our, in our marinades and rubs, when I say sweet chili, you actually feel them both. You really feel them both. So, you know, I mean, you get you get a hit from both both sides of the of, of the of the profile, the flavor profile. So the flavors are very very different, um, incredibly different. And we call it burakos, far, farmer food. You know, farmers food in Afrikaans, and they've got a very unique flavor profile. And they like their spices, they like their herbs. Uh, There's another thing that. Um, I don't even know what I can't even remember what it's called now. It's almost like we call it faint boss. It's almost like salt pushing. It's it's it kind of almost it almost tastes like like wild oregano, wild sage, or or wild rosemary, or or wild thyme. It's a combination of all these three spices, you know, these flavors, and we use a, we use that a lot in our food as well. You know, there's um it's just very different. It's very different to what uh, you know what Australians uh, tend to eat. But um, in, in terms of, in terms of uh, as I said to you before, in terms of our spices and that, we, we prefer it on the spicy side rather than the sweet. You're with Dan from Country Boys Barbecue, and you're listening to Smoking Hot Confessions. All righty, mate, we're nearly done for this episode. But before I let you go, I do have my one last question. Can you share with us, please, three pieces of advice for people looking to get into the charcoal business? Okay. First and foremost, before anything else, and it doesn't matter how many millions upon millions of dollars you've got, if you won the lottery and you're able to set up a plant tomorrow, don't go near it if you don't have the passion for it. That's the first thing. You need to have passion you need to have commitment and you need to have love for barbecue, love for people, love for fire, food, and friendship. That's the only advice I can give you guys. You really got to eat it, live it, breathe it, and love it. And if you do all that, you'll have a successful business and you'll have a very, very, very happy life. Words of wisdom there, mate. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Ben. Well, now, mate, I'm turning the studio, I'm turning the confessional over to you. So it's time for you to give any shout-outs you want to give out, any thank yous, etc., and tell people where they can track you down on the internet. Thank you, Ben. Okay, first and foremost, Ben, I want to thank you very much and, and the confessions, the Smoking Hot Confessions for having me on your show today. It was really a wonderful, wonderful uh, time chatting to you and a pleasure and my honor, mate. And I thank you very much. I also want to thank uh, my partner, Rob Shaw in South Africa, for working tirelessly doing a fantastic job, keeping the home fires burning for us, producing fantastic charcoal so that we can share it with the world. My partner in, in San Francisco, Rob Curran, who handles all our media, he handles all the hard work there and getting ready to launch in America next year. I want to thank him. I also want to thank all the barbecue teams that support us and uh, the barbecue teams that we sponsor. I want to thank my uh, distributors for doing a fantastic job. But more importantly, I want to thank the community that's Really support that really really believes in our products, and I want to thank everybody in Australia that has actually uh, has opened the doors to us and has made us feel so so welcome. I want to thank all you guys, and it wouldn't be possible without all these ingredients in place. In Australia, you can find us under uh, www.cleanheatbarbecue.com. 
You can also press and like our page, Clean Heat Barbecue, uh, on Facebook or on Instagram, Clean Heat underscore charcoal. And also look at, uh, you can also find us under AR Smokers on Facebook, and that is our company. We produce smokers or Kings of Smoke on Instagram as well. Mate, thank you. I got to say, it's been a privilege to have you on the show today. And uh, you know, I just want to say a, a big thanks for swinging by and sharing your knowledge and your wisdom with us. And um, mate, I've I always have a great time when we do catch up in person. And I'm really looking forward to uh, to seeing you again soon. Well, thank you very much, Ben. And it's been a long time between drinks. I think the last time we saw each other was in Melbourne at Meatstock, or the day before. And um, I hope it's not going to take another year before we see each other. But thank you very, very much once again for all the wonderful work that you do in the barbecue community as well, Ben. Um, you've done a tremendous, a tremendous, tremendous job with uh, uh, Smoking Hot uh, Confessions and with the podcast and your influence in the barbecue community. And also, thank you very much for all the, the wonderful posts that you post and your advice. And, and it's wonderful, and that's what it's about. And you really are. You're, you're an example to all of us, and it's a, a great example for us to be by. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Well, folks, that's this episode done like dinner. Abel has walked us through the processes involved in making briquettes and charcoal, what it's like running an international production and importation business, and shared some serious advice for anyone looking to get into doing something similar. Make sure you jump on Facebook and Instagram and follow Abel to not only look on as he goes on this adventure, but also to reach out to him to find out where you can get your hands on some of his environmentally friendly products. Coming up next week in episode five, we get a very unique behind the scenes view into the world of barbecue promoters. Bronnie from 4670 Barbecue is renowned for hosting the most friendly competition on the Australian circuit. She lets us in on all the things that go on that you don't see when you're at a comp and shares some stories about what happens when it all goes right and what happens when it all goes wrong. You don't want to miss out on this. Big thanks and much gratitude go out to this episode's sponsors, Harvey's Kitchen, Jagged Wood-Fired Smoker Ovens, and Pure Meats Robina. Their support makes this project possible. I've put their links in the episode description, so please click on through to their sites to claim those awesome offers for you loyal Smoking Hot Confessions listeners. If you have a message you'd like to get out to a barbecue mad audience, send me an email directly at ben at smokinghotconfessions.com. Shout outs also have to go to those who called in and left questions for Abel. Scotty, Matt, Josh, and Benton, I really dig that you guys are spending the time to get in on this, and Abel was really into it too. If you would like more, I have published a free ebook just for you. Head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com slash ebooks to get your copy now. I've put a link in the description. Also, head on over to Facebook and join the Smoking Hot Confessions community, and let's continue the conversation. It's a group dedicated to teaching, learning, and sharing all about barbecue, and all the BS is left at the door. Everybody has a place in the Smoking Hot Confessions community. Finally, however you're listening to this episode, please make sure you subscribe and leave a review. This way, the episodes will be delivered to more people's devices by automated drones secretly working for Skynet. Until next time, take care of each other, and keep on queuing. Thanks for listening to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. Head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com for recipes, tips, and Ben's own confessions. <laughs>